floor is yours. Hello, everyone. This is the TSC call. Not so weekly anymore, but uh, almost. Um, so uh, this is a public call. Anybody is welcome to join in and uh, listen in and even contribute. Uh, there are two requirements that must be met to doing so, though. The first one is to be aware and live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is currently displayed on the Zoom meeting window if you're online. And the other piece is the uh, code of conduct, which basically asks you to behave like a decent human being. So um, we have a bit of a special call this week. Uh, as I announced in my email uh, earlier this week, we have guest speakers who will be talking about uh, DCI issues. And uh, I will let uh, Dan uh, introduce them. Yeah. Uh, so for those who don't know, I'm Dan Middleton, and I'm also on the TSC with Arno and the others here. And a few months back in the Diversity, Civility, and Inclusion Working Group, we started building out more initiatives uh, and learning from other groups in best practices. And we're going to share more of those in their entirety over the next week or two. Uh, we're going to be giving a report from the, from the DCI Working Group after what will be about our first year in operation. But one of those recommendations is to look for opportunities to bring in diverse speakers from other organizations to enrich our thinking. And, you know, diverse speakers can mean anyone who really is going to be bringing in a, a new perspective to what we do. Uh, we're going to be looking to be recruiting from other open source organizations, other technical domains, uh, a variety of places. So far, we've, we've already heard, if you've attended our, our DCI working group meetings, we've already heard from Swarna Padilla and Caitlin O'Connell from the Cloud Foundry. And we've got a lot of best practices from them on uh, community development. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, we heard from Jim Gordon at Intel about how some of us can play roles as allies and how to get started in that, stay active in it. And today's talk is in some ways a little bit closer to home. Uh, we're delighted to have Rob Platnick and Keisha Bell from the DTCC with us. Many of you know Rob as our governing board chair at Hyperledger, so that's sort of why this is a little bit closer to home in some ways. Uh, Rob and I have often discussed the importance of diversity and growing a diverse and strong contributor base here at Hyperledger. And we thought it could be really useful to have DTCC, given their leadership here at Hyperledger, come in and talk about how that is conducted, how that's valued within their organization. Um, in part because what we have at Hyperledger, while we've got a completely open uh, contributor opportunity here, a lot of what we have is a reflection of the member companies and the contributing companies here. So uh, we're excited to hear more about how that's conducted at DTCC. And Rob wanted to make sure that while this is important to him, while he's very familiar with it, we brought in like the real expert there. And so we're really happy to have Keisha along with us. She's the managing director and uh, head of diverse talent management and advancement at the DTCC. And she's also got uh, a lot of experience at the DTCC having previously done uh, risk management reporting government governance analysis and program management uh, also as a managing director. So we're happy to have both of you here, Keisha and Rob, and I will uh, turn things over to you. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to give a really short intro and then hand it off to, to our, our beating heart of, mm -hmm. of our, um, progr our diversity program and our talent management, uh, Keisha. Um, so DTCC mm -hmm. is the premier post-trade market infrastructure for the financial industry, and that's for the global financial industry. We do clearing and settlement of trades uh, from exchanges across the country, and we do regulatory reporting on trades and institutional processing for trades around the world. So DTCC is a critical market infrastructure for the financial industry, but in a lot of ways, we're also a proxy for the industry. We're, we're, we represent the entire industry. We work on behalf of the entire industry. Uh, and we're governed and owned by the entire industry. So a lot of our, our focus on, on trust and integrity uh, and our core corporate values are, are intentionally reflective of what the financial industry's highest level and highest bar should be. 
DTCC was a premier member of Hyperledger and we were a founding member. So we joined early on. We saw the promise in distributed ledger technology in, in really the core proposition is built in privacy, built in integrity, built in trust, built in security, all built into that ecosystem. And then when Hyperledger started uh, and certainly working with Dan uh, and Chris uh, and Blythe Masters, uh, and some of the others who, who were coming together and say, let's take this distributed ledger model and create enterprise grade software around it that the entire world and the financial industry in particular could help drive, but that industries around the world could benefit from. And we've seen that realized. DTCC has been contributing code since 2016. Uh, and we have an internal set of, of uh, skilled people who work on it, uh, but we've also, shared that with our intern classes. Uh, we're working with, with various organizations like Girls Who Code. Uh, and across the organization from the very top, diversity has always been a critical issue at DTCC. And, and the, the mantra and the focus on bringing in diverse talent and really bringing in diverse perspectives and hearing all points of view and being open and, and not closing your mind and saying this is this is the way it is because this is the way I think about it, but talking to everyone in the room and bringing in as many diverse perspectives as possible has, is pervasive at DTCC. And one of the reasons for that and one of our beating hearts that is helping driving that uh, is the leadership of DTCC and in particular Keisha. Uh, who I've worked with for, for I, I might be getting near 20 years. Uh, at no, DTCC. not 20. Don't <laughs> okay. age me. Okay. <laughs> 15. Uh, I'm, I'm there much longer than 20. Uh, but we, we were, we were uh, she was my project manager when I was, I was uh, leading a portion of technology helping wealth management service and we were de delivering um, uh, systems to clients around the country. Uh, so we've worked together and, and I'm really, I was really thrilled to be asked by Dan uh, and Arno to to bring our perspective and to ask Keisha to, to show D, share DTCC's view. So Keisha, please, over to you. Thanks, Rob. Um, if someone could just bring up the presentation, I'm going to start on slide five. And uh, thank you all for having me here today. And I'm starting on slide five because I want to talk about our commitment and our definition of diversity. Um, and as Rob alluded to, this is something that underpins all of our efforts across the organization. It is recognized as a business imperative. So it is our employees' um, success and, D and DTCC's DNI journey is not just about a specific group, it's all of us together. It's about diversity, that everyone has a seat at the table and the table looks like society at large. Inclusion for us means everyone you've invited to the table feels welcome and recognized. Um, we have a clear vision and a clear mission that is articulated repeatedly throughout the organization and that is to fully integrate DNI um, into DTCC's community, into our culture, um, where all employees feel valued, respected, and played, respected and play an active part in the company's success. We can go to the next slide. Um, as Rob alluded to, that commitment um, to DNI started at the top of our organization, and I feel I feel strongly that if any organization is going to be successful with diversity and inclusion and any diversity and inclusion in initiatives, no matter how large or small you have to have commitment from your board of directors, and you also have to have commitment from the C-suite. Um, Mike Bodson, our CEO, has led the way for diversity and inclusion by doing things like publishing an op-ed, um, talking about diversity, talking openly about what we do at our company, talking about the progress we've made, and also saying that there's more to go. Um, leading the way and signing on, P signing on to C uh, PwC CEO Action for Diversity uh, pledge, um, making sure that in any of our business engagements with our customers at our technology summits and client summits, diversity and inclusion is part of our business discussion um, going forward. Then also, on, let's go to the next slide. Our board of directors is 35% women. That was intentional. Again, I want to talk about Mike's leadership as a CEO, but I also want to talk about um, the board of directors um, 
leading the charge and understanding that in order for uh, DTCC to succeed as an organization, we need to have as many diverse perspectives as possible. Uh, financial services firms tend to have somewhere around 20% gender representation or lower on their boards. So I'm happy to report that we're leading the way with 35% women. We have some more work to do in terms of ethnic minority representation on the board, but it is an active discussion in our organization. Um, and we realize that leadership needs to model the behavior that we want from the rest of the organization. And starting with diversifying the board it is key. Uh, to organization successes in their uh, uh, diversity and inclusion efforts. Next slide, please. Some of the awards we've won, um, some solicited, some unsolicited. Again, Forbes uh, 2020, the best, one of the best employers for diversity. It's an unsolicited award. Uh, Forbes uh, uh, canvases employees from an organization um, without the organization's knowledge uh, asking for asking them to complete a survey and compile scores and we were super surprised to receive this award we've been working at dni for about 10 years and so um, a, a pleasant um, unplanned recognition uh, forbes 2019 america's best one of america's best mid-sized companies um, again uh, something we are very very proud of um, best places to work eight consecutive years in a row. I was actually uh, one of the co-leads of our LGBTQ plus ERG, Employee Resource Group, which is a key lever to pull or to have in a successful DNI strategy, but I'll talk about that a little later. Um, I was one of the co-leads when we did our first um, assessment for uh, HRC, CEI, Corporate Equality Index for best places to work for LGBTQ employees. And our first score was, I think, 55%, 60% uh, eight years ago. And so we went about the work with our HR department, with the backing of our CEO, with the backing of our management committee to do the work to improve our benefits in our organization and to improve our policies and procedures so we could score 100%. And we've managed to keep all of those things in place uh, for us as an organization. But again, the support of the C-suite, the support of a management committee is key in making sure these initiatives are successful. 2016 Editor's Award for Diversity, uh, Global Custodian, Gate Leader Leadership, Open Finance Corporate Leadership Award, um, all wonderful, wonderful recognitions for our organization. We can go to the next slide. One of the ways um, we've also uh, fostered an inclusive environment is stepping out in front of um, certain societal challenges and taking a stand, um, signing on to the um, HRC's um, amicus brief, a signator for US versus Windsor uh, for the Business Coalition for Defense of Marriage Act repeal was key for us back in 2013, even though some of our policies didn't necessarily align um, with inclusion for LGBTQ plus employees. While we were doing that work, we thought it was important to step out in front and sign on to that business coalition, as well as the Equality Act. And more recently, we signed on to um, uh, Ascend. Uh, it was 100 plus corporations and partner organizations to support a COVID-19 um, action agenda, but one of the main focuses of that agenda was to combat um, anti-Asian American violence and backlash because of COVID-19 and some of the language that was going around um, that was very uh, incendiary towards the Asian American community. Uh, so again, making sure that you you are out front in, in on these issues and, and illustrating to your employee population that um, you care about things that uh, they are advocating for. We can go to the next slide. Some of our milestones um, in our, our 10 year DNI journey, but more uh, these things are, are more recent. Um, for the first time in 2019, uh, we promoted more women to managing director in a single year. And that's significant for us, and that's significant in terms of changing representation in our organization. And for the second year in a row, for 2019, um, more women were promoted to the executive director uh, level than men. Um, those first two populations, executive director and managing director, are our officer population, right? And they are indicative of the pipeline you might 
be building in lower levels um, for promotion and progression. And so we were ha happy to be able to do that. Um, but that took some work. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the things we did um, to make sure that we had a pipeline of, of women to be able to promote. Uh, we continuously improved our employee engagement scores for diversity and inclusion. Uh, we are now at eight points above uh, benchmark in our Glint survey, and that 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 directly correlates to some of the work around our policies, our procedures, our employee resource groups, our Voices of Inclusion series, um, and recognition and or training of a diverse population so that they can move up into um, the officer population, the organization. We also, in 2018 and, 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 excuse me, in 2019, completed our response to the first SEC diversity and assessment, uh, diversity and inclusion self-assessment, um, which is stipulated in Dodd-Frank uh, uh, 342, which is called their diversity clause. And that is, it, it is an assessment and it measures you on in, in certain uh, diversity frameworks, but it's significant because as a financial services firm, even though this is self-assessment went out to, I wanna say about 500 firms, um, I think we were one of maybe 15 in financial services that completed the self-assessment, which was noted by the SEC and also um, noted by uh, the House Financial Services Committee uh, subcommittee on diversity and inclusion. They use that as a source of information to understand how what big banks are doing to include to uh, ch change or improve diversity and inclusion in their workforce. We also introduced um, inclusive partner benefits uh, way before uh, other firms are doing that, and we expanded military and parental leave benefits. Um, at the bottom of this slide, those are the logos for all of our employee resource groups. Um, one of the key uh, or foundational elements in starting a successful um, diversity and inclusion strategy is to understand your workforce and provide an opportunity for people to come together around their affinity. Their affinity. Um, so we have Arise, we, uh, which is our Asian American uh, um, ERG, Bold, which is our Black employee ERG, Ignite, which is our, uh, what we call our millennial or younger uh, generation ERG, MVP is our Veterans ERG, Pride Plus is LGBTQ Plus, Unidos is our Latinx and Hispanic um, American ERG. WINS is our uh, women ERG. And We Thrive is actually our newest one we launched this year, which is to address people with uh, uh, disabilities or varying uh, abilities in the organization. 42% uh, of our employees are actively engaged. Again, this is a key tenet in building that inclusive culture in the organization. So let's go to the next slide. One of the ways uh, that Mike continually illustrates his commitment to diversity and inclusion was actually creating um, the Office of Diverse Talent Management and Advancement. We did have diversity and inclusion prior to me taking on this role at the end of 2018. Um, we had a diversity and inclusion um, uh, department along with our corporate social responsibility department. Um, and they reported into HR, which is a typical structure in organizations. But we'd been at this for a number of years. And while we had a lot of success, we had not managed to change representation significantly in our organization. And so Mike and the board recognized that and thought that um, diversity needed a, a, a different lens and it also needed to have a talent acquisition remit added, right? So in 2018, he pulled diversity and inclusion out of the HR department and had it report directly to him and, and charge me with leading it with um, a talent acquisition lens to help build a pipeline for our director level, our executive director level, and our managing director level into in our workplace um, and the latter to our officer population. So I took over the role um, in, in 2018, but what that did was signal to the organization that what we'd done so far was not enough, that we needed to do a bit more and that um, we were going to invest, we were going to put leadership there and provide direct accountability for successes and failures to the CEO of the company and also to the board, which was, I, I think, differentiates us from other financial services firms. So we can go on to the next slide, please. So my strategy and approach has been advancing talent, 
build communities, diversify the workforce, and strengthen our inclusive uh, work environment. So I'm just gonna spend a little time on a couple of things in advancing talent. Um, one of the things that I knew from my experience as being an African-American woman in financial services, um, the only African-American woman who's a managing director at our organization even today, um, I knew from my experience in the organization that I got a lot of mentorship, I got a lot of training, but I was missing something that could help me move along in the organization. So one of the things that I wanted to do in all of our talent programs was incorporate um, a formal executive sponsorship and accountability um, program. And sponsorship should happen organically, and it does, and it's that invisible lift that we all get. It's that, that, that someone advocating for you and banging the table for you when you're not in the room and saying Rob is absolutely the best person for that role or Keisha is the best person to take on that stretch assignment or that project. What I knew from my experience and what we knew from some surveys we took, some sentiment surveys we took in the organization, was that a lot of women and women of color in the organization felt like they were ready and knew the roles they were in or felt they could were ready to advance to other roles, but were not getting that lift and, and, and weren't getting that sponsorship. And that was borne out in the data that I looked at. Uh, one of the data points that I reviewed in the organization was that I looked at um, talent ratings, I looked at uh, performance ratings, but I also looked at promotions progress and progressions. And what I found is that the talent, the highest rated talent in the organization were women um, and were women of various backgrounds but promotions did not match that rating of those women. So that said to me, sponsorship was missing for those women, right? So, and then I wanna move over or move down to diversifying the workforce. Some of the things that stood out to me um, was that we didn't have a pipeline of top diverse candidates and we needed to refine our sourcing and recruiting practices. And what does that mean? We need to look where there's diversity. Um, we needed to engage with historically black colleges and universities. We needed to engage with Hispanic serving institutions. So we developed a strategy where we looked at our geographies um, in the US and we mapped out literally a physical map of the US and said, where are there historically black colleges and Hispanic serving institutions with uh, the curriculum that we need, technology, risk management, uh, product management, and, and, and finance, um, and where do their skill sets match up with ours, and how can we leverage those schools for either young talent or experienced talent by going to their alumni organization. So that's just one of the things that we did from a recruiting and sourcing practice um, in, in, in the organization. I'll move over to strengthen our inclusive um, environment. One of the things we wanted to do was to ha add a bit of gravitas to our business professional networks, which are now known as employee resource groups. You've heard me refer to them as ERGs. And so I wanted to make sure that our ERGs were fully engaged and, and, and it's not just a social function, right? That there is key, a part of our execution on our business strategy and our business imperatives is everything else. And so we realigned them. We gave them three pillars to work from. And one of those pillars is professional development. And so that all of the programming that the ERGs offer up, or most of the programming that they offer up, is about professional development of their constituency um, and not just kind of these social engagements. And then our Voices of Inclusion series this is where I think we've done the most work in bringing different perspectives to our organization, bringing in different speakers to talk about racial injustice, to talk about socioeconomic injustice, to talk about women in the workplace, to talk about the broken wrong for women in the workplace, all of these subjects that matter to a particular constituency in, in the organization, uh, we give voice to it to our, through our Voices of Inclusion um, uh, programming. So let's go to the next slide. So I say all that and all the wonderful things we've done. Here's what we look like as an organization. And I'm showing you this because I want one of the first things that I wanted to do was one, have data drive my strategy. Um, I, I didn't want to do anything 
necessarily out of emotion or out of my feeling of my experience in the organization or in financial services. I wanted to look at where we were in terms of representation and let that drive the strategy. But I also wanted to impart um, some transparency into the numbers. I think uh, for minority populations um, or people who are minority populations in organizations, um, when organizations ha don't provide that kind of transparency, it, it feels like you have something to hide, right? And it leaves people to make their own, draw their own conclusions about what the organization looks like by what they see visually, right? So I wanted to make sure that we shared um, our representation. A a this uh, slide is divided into executives, mid-level officials, professionals, administrative support workers, and all others. And I wanna focus on the top two levels, the executive and mid-level officials and managers. These are SIFMA categories because we participate in the SIFMA diversity study. Executives include our officers, our MDs and our EDs, and then the mid-level officials is our director and associate director population, and professionals is anybody below our associate director, senior analyst, analyst, associate, senior associate. All of our ethnic diversity or our ethnic diversity looks best in the professional area, in the lower levels of our organization, which said to me, okay, we've done a great job of building a pipeline, but why are we not progressing those people in the organizations and by, in the organization? And by the way, do we know who the superstars are in that professional category, right? Because if you look at the upper levels of the organization, uh, ethnic representation gets smaller and smaller. You see the same phenomenon happening in gender representation at the top, um, 42 and 58% professional uh, male to female. Um, it looks significantly different the further along you move or the further you ascend in the organization. Again, the same thing, the data is telling me we're doing a good job of getting people into the organization. We are not doing a good job of having people ascend in the organization. And um, so one of the things that I wanted to do was make sure we were offering programming, training, and development um, for those populations and also identifying people early enough in their careers. Um, one of the things that I also studied was the McKenzie Women in the Workforce um, survey. And this year's survey or 2020, 2019 results pointed out the broken rung for gender for women. Women in that professional category have a difficult time breaking into that first level of management. And there's a knock-on effect for the rest of a female's career in not breaking through that first barrier or taking longer than men to break through that first barrier or that step up uh, into management or an officer population. I, saw, I see the same phenomenon happening in our company, so uh, I wanted to address that. So let's go to the next slide. I came up with a theme for the year. It's the year of allies and sponsors. Um, I wanted to focus the organization on women of all diversity uh, because overall DTCC is 37% female, which in 2020 didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, so that said to me, again, we needed to do more with the women we have in the organization of all backgrounds and then also draw in more women uh, of different backgrounds. So recruit, retain, promote. Uh, that's my mantra, more targeted outreach to hiring sources, partner with our talent acquisition team because we still do have a full talent acquisition team within the HR organization, and expansion of hiring sources, which I have a bit more later in the presentation. Uh, retain, focusing on women of all diversities, create access to sponsorship, promote a more inclusive workplace. What I did there, I realized that we could not uh, divorce men from the uh, expansion or inclusion of women in the workplace if men are in the position to make the hiring decisions and or promotion decisions. I recognized that we needed to create allies and sponsors and so I embarked upon training for men and women in the organization about how to be allies and sponsors so we can go to the next slide. That training was MARC, Men Advocating and Advancing Gender Equality in a Workplace, or Men Advocating for Real Change. And uh, the target for this training was the officer population. I believe there's 300 or something of us. Um, and it was 
It's about the importance of engaging men. It's about individual and shared identity. It's about Mark leadership is about cult cultural systems, the in-group and the out-group dynamic, dynamics. They cover privilege in the workplace. They cover male privilege in the workplace and gender norms. They cover unconscious bias, accountability, and credibility. It is a, an intensive day and a half training for men and women to kind of sit together and go through a number of exercises addressing privilege, unconscious bias, individual and shared identity. And at times it's uncomfortable, but it's absolutely necessary to get folks in the place where they can be allies in the workplace. Another one of the things that I did in talking about creating a cult, an inclusive culture and addressing sponsorship in the organization was that um, there were really talented women directors in the organization that had not been promoted. They were rated uh, in our nine block enterprise leader, emerging leaders, but they were not being promoted in the organization. So we uh, started a program called Advancing Women Leaders, where we have 16 women directors who are on the cusp of moving from director into the office of population to executive director, but had some um, development needs. And so it's a, a year and a half uh, formal training program, very individualized, very high touch with uh, access to sponsorship and customized coaching and development. And so this is three or four of those women have been promoted already into the executive director. And this year we expect a number more to be uh, promoted into the office of population. But again, a very specialized high touch program. We also have something similar for our emerging women leaders. That's our associate and associate director population plus senior associates. Um, again, addressing that broken rum rung and that pipeline into director and executive director. A similar six month formal leadership coaching program for women uh, identified as upcoming leaders. And then another key lever that we wanna pull is getting more mid-level and senior level women into the organization. And so we partnered with uh, a program called I Relaunch that's run out of Columbia University. These are women who left the workplace for mid-career for one reason or another, child care, parental care, whatever, who've got a wealth of experience, but who, when seeking to re-enter their workplace, are usually downgraded several levels. Some women have held executive director, managing director positions at other organizations. When they seek to re-enter their workforce after the break, they are not even offered um, officer level roles. And what is typically missing is some, they need some reskilling. So we launched on, uh, upon a reemerge internship program. I think we have about three women in the organization, mid-level women, so that the hiring manager can try out this mid-level um, resource for uh, 12 to 16 weeks. And at the end of the 16 week period, we bring them in at the associate director level and we've had some success with that already. So let's go to the next slide. And I just wanna do a time check. Um, I show I have about three or four minutes left and I'll try to cover this and leave some time for questions. Um, so reflections from the Men Advocating for Real Change workshop. These are some of the things that we've asked the participants to do after they leave. It's not a one and done. It's not a day and a half training. This is something that we will continue, continually check in on determine your personal perspective and position on the topic of women's advancement. Recognize and accept your own biases. Be mindful of them. As male leaders, you must accept, recognize and accept your privilege. Uh, recognize the barriers that exist for women's advancement. Educate yourself. Raise your hands as allies and as sponsors. Um, advocate, actively advocate for women as male colleagues or people managers of women in the organization, evaluate your daily practices. Is there bias in that? Is there bias in your behaviors? Commit yourself to objective listening, listening with empathy and learning how you can understand more deeply and incorporate all of this in your annual plans as appropriate. Again, guidance for these managers to go forward when they bring this training back to, into their own organization. Let's go to the next slide. And then uh, recent events, you know, the murder of George, George Floyd um, really brought to the surface um, things that African Americans or black and brown people typically don't bring to the workplace, right? And we tend to cover, compartmentalize. Um, our, our, there's a, a fine line, there's a very thick line or wall between 
your existence in the workplace and your existence outside the workplace, right? And so we felt that we needed to address this as a company, not necessarily externally by making a statement or putting Black Lives Matter on our workplace, but addressing our employee population. So one of the first things that we did was um, our CEO issued a statement our board of directors issued a statement to the employee population. And I, as a leader and one of the more senior African-American leaders in the organization, uh, posted a blog post about how I was feeling, covering the topics of covering and compartmentalizing and the emotional impacts of the intersection of my identity as an African-American woman and a a as a professional in the workplace and what this social unrest was doing to me as a, an individual. And what that does is um, open the doors for other people to have those same types of discussions. And then we follow that on with a uh, perspective taking or perspective discussion with some of our uh, employees. Our first perspective discussion was with African-American men in our organization, at black and brown men in our organization, talking about their experience with policing. Um, and when I tell you it was uh, revolutionary, um, it was eye-opening to a lot of people. It was painful that their colleagues who they work with for years, who they sit next to, they don't know that some of them have, are repeatedly stopped by the police. Some of them have been arrested on their way to work, right? The second conversation that we had in the workplace and the reflections discussion or perspective taking discussion was around with black and brown women talking about their experience with the talk. I don't know if everyone's seen the Procter & Gamble video about the talk, about having the discussion with black and brown children about societal racism at a very young age. Um, and these women were quite open about their experiences with their children or their extended family members in having those conversations. Again, very painful, very eye-opening, but absolutely necessary to build an inclusive environment. We could not, um, just pretend in the workplace that this was not happening and um, affecting an, a part of our population. So let's um, move forward because I know I'm running out of time. Um, I'll, I'll skip this slide. Let's go to the next one. I talked about diversity sourcing a bit and where you look for that talent. Here's some of the organizations that we've um, engaged. Um, ALPA, Association of Professionals for America, that is a Latinx and Hispanic serving um, organization. Center for Talent Innovation, um, Lesbians Who Tech, Reaching Out MBA, Grace Hopper for Female Talent, Fairy Godboss, we have a great partnership with them, National Black MBA Association, Spellhouse, um, Spellhouse, Spellman and Morehouse are two of the most prominent HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. So we forged a relationship with their alumni association. Ascend uh, for Pan-Asian Leadership, Girls Who Code, National Society for Black Engineers, the Black Ivy League, uh, Black Enterprise Magazine, Jopwell, Out Women in Business, Working Mother uh, Media. Again, you have to reach a lot further than your typical sources to get that talent, but that talent is out there um, and, and ready. And then on the next slide, um, these are the HBCUs and Hispanic serving institutions um, that we have targeted for either junior level talent or, or alumni association. Uh, um, level talent, Atlanta uh, Clark University, which is Clark, Atlanta University, Morehouse and Spelman, Florida A&M, Morgan State, North Carolina A&T University, Prairie View A&M, and University of Mar Maryland Eastern Shore, and for Hispanic serving institutions, Baruch College, Polytech, University of Puerto Rico, Rutgers, University of Puerto Rico, University of South Southern Florida, and University of Texas Dallas. Again, it's just about thinking about those sources of talent very, very differently. I, you could have never told me two years ago I would be looking at University of Puerto Rico, but why not, right? Why not look there for talent if that's what you, you really need? So that's the end of my presentation. I know I've talked a lot. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have um, on the presentation or some of our strategy or what we've done. Hey, thanks, Keisha. That was fantastic. Um, I bet we've got some some questions in the audience. Maybe people thinking about well, how does uh, how do some of these professional considerations relate to what we do in open source? Or maybe you've got some ideas about how they relate uh, in the audience. You want to share that out? Um, I'll go ahead and kick things off with two very difficult questions. One for mm -hmm. each of you, and I'll ask them simultaneously. Maybe give you a chance to to think for a second. 
maybe the hardest one to Keisha, hardest because I'm going to ask you to think back 15 years. Um, uh, I think that's what I heard for, for when you joined the DTCC. Can you think of an interaction that you had around the time that you started there that made you want to continue and, and might be one of the reasons that you're still there after 15 years? And mm -hmm. then um, Rob, we heard from Keisha repeatedly about the importance of support from the board, uh, about the support from the, the CEO. Uh, from our perspective in Hyperledger, can you reflect on the board's ability to help us grow our diversity and inclusion? Sure, I'll start. Um, you know, I've got a number of <laughs> stories, but um, I reported to, and Rob alluded to this earlier, I was in product management and I ran a business and wealth management for alternative investment products. And I reported to one of the only women that led a business there. Um, and I had always been out as a lesbian, but I had never really, was really open about it, right? And um, Ann Bergen, who's the woman I'm talking about and who's still running a, a significant portion, portion of our SIFMU business, said to me, you know, and I was younger in my career and a little more tentative. And one day in our one-on-ones, I walked into her office and I sat down and she said, so tell me about your girlfriend. And <laughs> I said, what? She said, so tell me about your girlfriend. Are you planning to get married? What are you going to do? And, and it was a series of questions about my personal life. And anyone else might have considered that intrusive, but it opened the door for me and it made it okay for me. We always talk about everybody should bring their full self to work, but a lot of us don't do that. It opened the door for me and made me able to bring my full self to work because in that moment, she asked some wrong questions. She asked some right questions, but she wasn't afraid to be vulnerable and say the wrong thing, but was really interested and curious about me. And from that point forward, I committed to myself that I was not going to hide um, my queerness, that I was going to be out, uh, but she made it okay for me, so. That's great, that's a great story. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so from, from my perspective, you know, I know at the board level, we've been, we've been spending a lot of time talking about diversity. Blythe left us with a, a, a challenge uh, in terms of trying to get the board to a certain level of, of gender diversity in a very short period of time, uh, which I think um, we actually decided was, was, a, uh, was a, like too far. There, were, there just weren't enough candidates in the pipeline and we all wanted to focus on, on building out that pipeline. Um, but I think in the broadest level, we've been sponsoring diversity scholarships in our global forum. Uh, we've been working on on outreach to various academic institutions. And to Keisha's point, it really, it really starts with filling a pipeline and making sure that there is a good pipeline uh, of talent that, that's in there. And quite honestly, I, I think there's a lot more we need to do as a board, but I think there's a lot more we need to do in particular as in the industry and the open source community. I think the open source community, especially in STEM, in anything in technology, is just hugely white male. And we, we need to change that pipeline to be more reflective of the rest of the world. What I find particularly interesting in the distributed ledger community, our community, is there's a tremendous amount of passion, but that passion often manifests itself as very stubborn opinions about the way something should be built or the way something should, should be um, you know, implemented to maintain some view of purity to some uh, hyperledger or blockchain uh, uh, pot standard or, or Bible or, or something. So I think more than any community, we could benefit from a real open-mindedness and a diversity of perspectives and bringing in more, more of different points of view. And in particular, the, one of the beauties of the distributed ledger model and of all the different conversations around it is the potential for inclusion and the potential that uh, a digital model and a, decentral, a more decentralized model could bring more uh, participation from the unbanked and from different parts of, of our community and the global community. So I think there's tremendous opportunity. We've got the, uh, the best possible story to sell 
the issue is really driving it down and having the structures in place as Keisha described to say, we're going to get to do this with intention. You know, we've, Brian and I have talked a lot about academic outreach and we've got a number of different colleges that are part of the open source community, but we need to spend more time reaching out to some of the institutions that Keisha listed and other institutions, you know, that are in geographies that DTCC doesn't necessarily necessarily touch, but in other parts of the, of the, you know, domestic uh, plane in the US, but globally as well, uh, to bring lots of different views and perspectives and lots of different talent into this community. So I think we've got a tremendous opportunity. I think we have the right mindset, but we need to do more. That's great, that's great. I think it would be really interesting to have a good discussion with the board about that pipeline aspect, since it is really, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of the contributors that come into Hyperledger are from member companies or premier companies. Uh, and even the companies that aren't actually contributing talent right now, you know, what a perfect opportunity for them to help uh, get in the, the diverse talent that we're lacking. All right, guys, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to jump in there. We have a couple of other items we want to cover today, so we have 10 minutes left. But thank you very much for your time. Thank uh, you. It's very appreciated. Thank you. Bye. Feel Thanks free to drop off now. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so with that being done, I would like to focus the last few minutes we have on covering some of the rest of the agenda. The quarterly reports are pretty straightforward. I went through it. I think most of them have been reviewed by the majority of the TSC members. I didn't see any issues being raised. Oh, and so I think we can just skip that part. Uh, I would like to get to the HIP process uh, move to GitHub. There was an attempt to try to come to resolution on in, in, via email. And Rai, I thank you for trying that. It didn't completely work though. So I was hoping we could just close this very quickly. Um, there was already a motion to move this uh, 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 to, uh, from, uh, uh, who is it? Mark, I think, made the motion. And so some of us voted by email, but not everybody. So. I will just kind of shortcut the process here and ask, is anybody objecting, opposing the, 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 the move? Is there any concerns? Let's just be more open. Okay, so anybody wants to be uh, listed as abstaining on this issue? Okay, hearing none, I think it's a non-controversial issue. That's why I'm trying to hurry up. I think we can close it and declare it approved. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And so that brings us to the other part of the agenda, which is a discussion item that Brian wanted to bring up. Brian, the floor is yours. Uh, no, no, I, I, it's not. I, I said I would uh, put some stuff uh, online first, so. So Let's what? Sort of that later. Yeah. Oh, right. really? You made yep, me no, hurry I'm... up and push everybody around, and now you're just saying uh, I uh, didn't push uh, anybody <laughs> around. Uh... No, I did. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I thought they wanted um, this. Uh, no, there's. Uh, I, I. Okay, so um, it, uh, since we have just a, f a few minutes, um, uh, there's a uh, reg standing monthly meeting that we have been having uh, between the maintainers and the uh, marketing committee um, to try to help uh, folks who are out there talking about Hyperledger, you know, beyond the maintainer uh, and core contributor community, um, be better in sync with upcoming releases with. Um, uh, features they want to highlight, that sort of thing. And um, attendance on that had started to wane. Uh, and so I, I really, I, I, so this is great, actually, if we do have some time for conversation, because uh, it might be high bandwidth here. Um, uh, it just, what it didn't, it, it was starting to feel like whether, uh, it was a question whether kind of a, a monthly phone call like this was an effective way to reach the maintainer community. Um, I, and and then, uh, I, you know, if the participation on that, I think, you know, we had um, Dave Enyart from Fab attend uh, Sarah from Aroha so we didn't have zero but um, I just wanted to bring up what are more things that we might do or a different way of, of trying to uh, have a productive engagement something maintainers want to come and attend um, so let me leave that open uh, and then um, you know maybe we can talk about specific actions 
Uh, does anyone have on the TSC have thoughts on that? Yeah, one one quick thought off the top of my head is if the maintainers aren't coming to the the marketing and, and dev relations meetings, then could we reverse that? So most of the projects have some sort of standing community meeting. Uh, maybe we could have the, uh, the the marketing people go to those a, as an agenda topic. That's certainly possible. I think uh, um, those meetings seem to be very focused on um, uh, you know making what feels like pretty concrete technical decisions, um, and and I think the making room for conversations about. DevRel and, and, and marketing feel, I, I, at least historically when I've been on those calls have felt, uh, um, you know, like they might struggle for, for oxygen from the, from the agenda. Um, if you think that that's, that's better, the, the challenge might be getting, you know, the marketing committee to be able to attend many of those calls, right? And so this is a way to try to uh, optimize kind of time on everyone's part ra rather than um, having, having 10 meetings a, a month, try to have one meeting, but um, yeah. So I have a question. The uh, I'm sorry, Dan. Did you want to finish that conversation before I go to the next topic? Just the last trailing thought was it doesn't even have to be a recurring thing. Um, just get it in on their their radar by getting into one meeting might help. Sure. Okay, that's a good idea. Tracy. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I, I guess you know one of the things that I'm thinking about is this meeting was originally created in order to attempt to get additional contributors to some of the projects that weren't uh, seeing as much traffic, if you will. And so I guess I wonder what what advancement has there has been made in that regard with these meetings, and you know have we met that goal, and do we need to refocus ourselves on that particular goal? I mean, the, the the meetings I was talking about were framed as let's get the 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 the, the people very active on the projects, maintainers presumably, but but you know certainly these are public meetings, so anybody could attend um, together with the people who are most active, and not just Hyperledger staff, right? Uh, the people in our community who are out there giving talks or or um, you know uh, uh, otherwise out there advocating, um, and who are part of the marketing committee as well, thinking about our balance of of spending on our and and which events we go to and those sorts of things, right? Um, uh, and it was also partly to say, here are some uh, standardized things we're doing for outreach, you know, like this upcoming month, here's the social media tag that we'd love to organize a bunch of content around. And so if anyone knows of things happening related to trade finance and any of your projects, let us know, you know, like that kind of cross project kind of conversation. Um, uh, and, and I think the, the hope is that these marketing activities are not just kind of, you know, focused on businesses and use cases and, and, and such, but on uh, attracting developers as well, I mean, new developers and, and such. Um, I don't think they were in, intended to necessarily be meetings about uh, how do we make the first time user experience uh, uh, you know, fantastic, or the latter from being a new user to becoming a, uh, a core maintainer uh, better, uh, which, is, which is an important part of DevRel, um, uh, but does seem to be very project by project specific. Um, uh, it certainly can be, um, but I, 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 yeah, I mean, if that's, if that's a, a something to, to, to put on the agenda for these calls, that would help attract the maintainers to them. That would be, that would be interesting as well. But we haven't formally measured anything against a, a goal like a goal like that yeah no i just I, I remember that you know we had so many of the projects coming into the tsc reporting on you know lack of diversity lack of new contributors um and wanting a avenue of reach out to new developers and, and so um yeah, I guess I think I was under the impression that that's part of what these calls were attempting to accomplish. Yeah, it, definitely to get the word out uh, to 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 developers and 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 new potential users. Yeah, and we send uh, Hyperledger sends one or two emails a week, right? For and we're always we're always looking for like technical topics to add to those. Uh, so that's like another venue that it's, it seems pretty hard to get participation on. Yeah, I mean, Ray's talking about like there's a weekly email that goes out to everybody who wants one. It's like a newsletter um, uh, with kind of the, the the top three things going on this week or that that have recently happened, pointing people to recordings of of 
uh, you know, conversations, you know, uh, uh, recent releases, that sort of thing. Um, but often our content channels just don't know what's going on in our projects. You know, I mean, we read the status updates and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and, uh, and we do reach out when we, when we hear hints of things. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we also know it's, it's really hard as a project to do things like maintain, you know, product roadmap kind of documentation and that sort of thing, or to be predictive about what's coming when a lot of it is driven by pull request and, and, um, an opportunity. So, uh, I do want to, uh, uh, highlight the, the Bezu and Fabric, uh, communities who've done a really great job in this and Sarah doing this uh, with a lot with the Roja. So, um, uh, you know, I think it was just broadly stated as a way, to, especially for the projects that have a bit less participation or that are younger, like like Cactus and Avalon. Um, you know, understanding what those are and where they're heading is 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 sometimes a, a challenge. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, but my main question is: is the format of a monthly call uh, the right thing? Because calls themselves have uh, challenges when it comes to participation. You have to find a time when everyone's awake <laughs> around the world. Um, and everyone has, you know, uh, I would wager probably too many calls uh, in their lives, in their weeks, in their months, um, uh, especially right now. I, I feel like I live on Zoom. Um, uh, but sometimes it feels like email threads kind of, you know, go into the void and don't get responded. So um, happy to continue doing the calls. I just felt like in particular the format uh, yeah, I mean, speaking for myself, Brian, I, I've attended a couple of those calls and I thought they were interesting. I just, you know, usually I can't because there's some conflict and then that's the challenge I guess a lot of people have. But I think it'd be interesting for people in TSC to take it as an action item to go back to their projects and, and talk to the, the maintainers and ask them, try to understand is this, you know, not of interest to you or you know why isn't anybody attending okay. because clearly a very few projects are represented on those calls so we should try to find out i think the best idea that we've heard and we had talked about this as well was uh going to each of the maintainer uh calls um once at least once to talk about this uh, yeah. directly with the maintainer groups um even if it's not uh, uh, a technical topic for the agenda hopefully we'll get some room um not all the projects have been having regular maintainer calls. So, um, well, you know, that'll be a challenge for some, but, um, but we'll fan out and uh, report back. All right, so thank you. We're out of time. So I'm gonna close the call on this, but uh, thank you all for joining. I do want to point out that uh, Brian uh, posted on the DCO issues. And so if you haven't seen this, I invite people to have a look and react to the proposal he's made to basically close the issue. And, uh, you know, we can use the wiki to uh, exchange further on this. So with that being said, uh, I expect we'll have a call next week, might be the following week, I don't know yet. I will let you know in email. So in the meantime, thank you all for joining. Have a good day.